Hello, and welcome to Let's Talk, a new series of candid conversations covering the issues facing freelance professionals today. I'm Tom Rizzo, your host, managing director and founder of Plectrum Advisors, an investment advisory firm based in Los Angeles. On each episode of Let's Talk, I'll be speaking with some of the most plugged in experts to help you and me make sense of today's changing environment and to help you be smarter about how to approach work and life. So let's get started. Today's guest on Let's Talk is Sam Zadori. Sam is a highly regarded real estate agent and mortgage broker. And as you might imagine, Sam's pretty busy these days, what with interest rates being at historic lows. Many people are considering refinancing to take advantage of these attractive rates. And Sam is one of the best people I've found to help manage and navigate this often complex and bewildering process. So welcome, Sam. Thank you for being here today. Hello, Tom. Thank you for having me on your show. Um, yes, I'm a mortgage broker and uh, we represent uh, majority of our clients are freelancers, people that are in, in the business of writing, producing TV shows or musicians that are on, um, on income that may not be as easy and simple as a W-2 employee to substantiate. Uh, so that's the bulk of our uh, clientele, um, and we help them refinance their existing loans, or we help them purchase uh, a new home. Uh, we help them, you know, bring their financing together. Um, post COVID and in, in the pandemic world, um, self-employed uh, borrowers have been quite challenging to get approved with most lenders out there. Almost every lender out there. Um, so our specialty is really to look into details, make sure what it takes to get them qualified uh, before we push this loan into underwriting. Um, and that's really what our specialty is. That's what we do uh, with most of our clients. You know, a, uh, a lot of my clients have been asking me, you know, is this a good time to refinance? You know, are things going to get better? Are they going to get worse? Um, and what, uh, what do you say when people ask you that question? Yeah, I think it's definitely a great time to refinance. Um, mortgage rates are quite low. Everyone can, can hear and hears about it almost every day. Um, yeah, it's a great time to refi. It's a great time to buy if someone's in the market to purchase. Money is quite inexpensive. Um, the environment uh, moving forward from this point, we think it's going to be pretty flat, meaning staying in the same range as it is today for, for the next year, probably most part of 2021. Um, so it is a good time to pull the trigger if it's a refi or a purchase right now. Um, but we don't see rates going anywhere. Uh, within within the next at least six months. That's that's the projection we have. Can you take people through a little bit about what they could expect to pay, what the range of rates are, and how long the process takes? Uh, yes, I mean I'll, I I can give you a, a range, but look, every every loan, every loan amount, every borrower is different. So pricing for one person doesn't necessarily mean it fits someone else, but Yes, range-wise, we're, we're somewhere in the mid-twos, high-twos, um, all the way to high-threes, mid-threes. And we're, we're, we're talking about um, conforming agency loans, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. These words may you know, mean, mean something to, to people listening to us right now. These are agency loans where typically um, you get the better rates. Then there are loans that are jumbo within a certain um, loan amount. You fall into the jumbo category and you, you tend to pay slightly higher rates for jumbos. But again, even jumbos are, are in the mid threes to high threes right now. I would say probably closer to mid threes, even low threes. Yeah. Can, can you, can you uh, give the, um, the viewers a, 
um, an understanding of uh, at least a little that I know about it. There's, there's three kinds of loans. There's a, a conforming one, and then there's a high dollar and a jumbo. Can you talk a little bit about those three types? Yes. Conforming loans are up to 510400 Anything over 510400 to uh, 675 600 I'm sorry, 765 600 That's the cap for a high balance loan. So, so there is conforming up to 510400 Anything above that, cap of 765 600 is a high balance loan. Now those are agency loans, meaning Fannie Mae loans, or Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, secondary market purchasers of these loans, uh, they, they tend to have more reasonable rates, and the guidelines are, uh, I wouldn't say the guidelines are less restrictive, but they're easier to process rather than a jumbo loan. So, but let's stay with the loan amounts, 510, 400, lower rate, Slightly higher rate if you're above 510, 400, all the way to 765, 600. Once you pass that threshold, you're in the jumbo world. Tends to be a little bit more expensive, but more importantly, the lending guidelines are stricter for a jumbo loan. If a uh, if a potential borrower borrower has assets, let's say they've got. Um, a significant amount in a brokerage account or uh, that kind of thing. Does that impact either the rate or the cost of the loan for them, either positively or negatively? Assets are generally required, whether it's a, it's a conforming loan, depending on a certain debt to income ratio. And I'm throwing all these, these words out and they probably don't mean much to, to people that are watching this. Um, but I'm trying to demonstrate that there's really no uh, one answer to these questions. Every borrower is different. So assets are great. Yes, if you do have assets, it makes the file look stronger. And sometimes, in fact, you don't need assets to get a file approved. Sometimes you do need assets to get the file approved, depending on other the structure of the loan that's been put together. Um, so, Assets don't necessarily mean you're going to get a better rate or a more favorable structure or more favorable structure to the loan. Um, but assets are important for qualification purposes, right? Especially in the jumbo world, where if, if you have a jumbo loan, assets are very important. If you own more than one property, assets are very important to have, right? Uh, if you um, if you're refinancing rental, a rental property, an investment property, then assets are important. We want to look at those assets. Um, now, sometimes assets are used um, in lieu of showing income that's enough to get a person approved based on their taxes. So we'll look at taxes. There isn't enough income on the table to get them approved, but an in individual may have large assets and we can use parts of that several income, several accounts that they have with an, with an investment account. We can use part of that to substantiate X amount of money for the next three years as income. So there are formulas involved that can be used to help someone qualify by just by using tax returns. Those rates are higher, right, on those loans. So again, I'd like to demonstrate the complication of these deals. So when, when we qualify someone based on a product called asset depletion, that's a way of calculating income. Yes, you can get the loan, you can refi your purchase, but expect that rate to be higher. Can you, can you talk a little bit about, um, uh, in, in your particular case, you work with freelancers frequently. Um, and I know just my own personal experience uh, uh, fairly recently with, with some real estate transactions where um, uh, the loan broker was not as familiar with um, the nature of freelance income 
And I, I had to kind of go through a, a process just with the broker to try to get him to understand um, how it is that we made our living and that uh, although it, it seems abnormal to him, uh, to us, it's very normal, and there's a whole community that works this way. Can you can you talk a little bit about uh, the challenges that freelancers have and how you address those in terms of uh, being able to uh, help the underwriters get an understanding of their position? Yeah, um, they're challenging. Most you know most freelancers have either they file a Schedule C or they may have a corporation that. That will they'll run their income through and they'll get paid through their own corporation. Um, they those are the those are the more simpler clients, and we have clients that that own multiple businesses and their their income is quite challenging, complicated. They have several corporations that we have to read through and make sure they they make money, and um, so they tend to get quite complicated. Very, very challenging, especially in this environment where, as I said, uh, with, with COVID impacting the economy, impacting people's way of life, underwriters, scrutinize self-employed borrowers um, very closely. In fact, some lenders don't even want them anymore, right? Um, it's, it just becomes very complicated for them to, uh, they have to spend a lot of time underwriting loans, and some, some lenders actually push those away. They don't want them. Um, but we, we, so each lender, each investor has a certain set of guidelines that we have to read through very carefully and to make sure that certain borrower fits those guidelines. So before we, so we'll package a loan. We, in fact, we process a loan. We'll go through their documentation, make sure we nail down the income as accurately as, accurately as possible. We communicate with the underwriter where, where we're intending to send the file, which the lender we're, we're intending to send the file to. We'll communicate with them and make sure that individual fits the product we're looking for before we send this out and start spending a lot of time on it. So in a way, when we process a file, we almost underwrite it, right? We almost make sure that it's doable before it leaves our desk. Um, yes, we deal with a lot of uh, self-employed people, a lot of uh, um, freelancers. Um, and in this environment, they're quite complicated. How about uh, what effect does the uh, applicant's FICO score have on the either the rate or the ability to get the loan? Um, depending on the loan type, if, if we're in the conforming category, right, the $510,000 loan amount mm -hmm. um, up to the high balance loan amount, um, those FICO scores um, are could be quite low. You can be in the high 600s and still qualify. Now, the lower your FICO score, the lower your middle credit score, we run three, three bureau credit, and then we look at your middle, link, middle credit score. But the lower the score, the higher the rate. So there's a premium that a borrower will pay if their score is too low. Now, sometimes there, there are products that require a certain credit score for a borrower to qualify. 700 credit score, 740 credit score. If you don't hit that point, then you don't qualify. So it really depends on what we're looking for. Uh, jumbo transactions are always, they're required to be in the 700s. So 700 plus. The higher your score, sometimes there is an improvement in price. If your score is lower than 700 and you're looking for a $2 million loan, probably won't happen in this environment. And, and how about collecting the data that's necessary? I think it's uh, one thing that's challenging for a lot of people that I know is, is how do they find all the documents that you require in order to process the loan? How does that work? Good question. Most of those, most of our independent operators, uh, people that have 
you know, they're, they're corporations that pay, pay, pay themselves through self-employed people. Most of these clients have a business manager um, or a CPA that handles their paperwork. And we simply get authorization from the borrower. We get in touch with the CPA or the business manager and we'll put all the paperwork together. In most cases, the borrower doesn't need to touch that aspect of it. It can get quite complicated. We look for quarterly, quarterly statements, monthly statements, tax returns for two years, um, corporate returns, personal returns, W-2s, um, multiple pay stubs maybe if that's the case. Um, so a lot of paperwork is required if the borrower, if the client isn't the type of person that keeps that in order, then we go through their business manager. We go through their CPA. Simply, the, In fact, that's how we prefer it. It's much cleaner that way. I, I think that's a big anxiety point for most people is um, they're, you're going to ask them to provide a document and they, they don't, they're not even familiar what the document is or that kind of thing. So I, I like that um, the uh, uh, the responsibility of this can be passed on to the other professionals that help them in their lives. And uh, I think it's, it's just, it's a cleaner way to do business and can remove some of the worry that the, the potential borrower can have um, that uh, um, their other professionals can help provide, you know, this kind of documentation. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it can, it can get complicated. Um, it even gets even more complicated in case of a purchase transaction where you have um, more than just us involved. There's, there's escrow and there are multiple agents involved. Um, so it does, it tends to get complicated and you know, we try to make it as nice and clean as possible just by being able to go to the source and get what we need. So How is if, it? If, if, for, if, if for a client, this, this may, for a client, you're absolutely right. It, it, um, it may be a point where uh, they get turned off and they don't want to take the step to move forward. Yeah. Um, but I really want to emphasize that don't let that stop you because if, if you're in a high rate scenario, you're paying 3%, 3.5%, 4%, um, you're wasting money in this environment, you definitely need to redo your loan. And um, if paperwork is the complication, uh, we can help clean that up, yes. What's, a, um, what's the trigger point that someone, let, let's say someone has recently either refied or recently purchased something within the last several years and, and has some kind of a reasonable rate, um, how, uh, it, it, is there a magic number between what they're paying, the rate that they currently have, and what they could get as a current rate where it generally makes sense to start this process? So when you refinance, you're, um, you're paying cost. There, there are third-party fees that, you, that, the, that a client pays, escrow fees, title fees, um, underwriting fees. And what we want to look at is how much does it cost to take the existing loan to a new lender, refi the money? How much does that move cost and how much money does that individual save over, you know, in, in monthly savings or in an annual amount of savings and see how long it takes to recoup the cost. Generally, we want to see someone recoup. Fantastic, if someone can recoup within a year, Two years is quite reasonable. Anything beyond that could could be questionable. So we really have to look at numbers and see if it makes sense to to move the money to a different lender and refund. But look, uh, we're speaking of a, a rate and term refinance, purely reducing the rate from one lender to the next lender. Now there are some borrowers who have unsecured debt; they have credit card debt that they can roll into their mortgage. So that may be um, another trigger for someone to say, hey, you know, I have 25, 35, 40 thousand dollars worth of credit card debt and I'm paying 12 percent, 15 percent. Can I take this, roll it into my mortgage and pay three percent, right? So that's debt consolidation. Someone may be looking for pulling equity out to uh, 
add square footage to, our, to their home or, or to remodel. So there are many triggers, but purely from the standpoint of one rate to one rate, a rate and, a rate and term refinance, we basically look at how long does it take to recoup the cost. And, and how, how long does the whole process take, Sam, on, a, on uh, an, an average basis, from the time somebody would contact you to the time that the whole thing would be done? What's, what's the range of that? Generally 30 days, um, but that changes. Uh, lenders get busy in this low rate environment. If, if, if we have a lot of volume or if lenders have a lot of volume, underwriting tends to be slower appraisals take place slower so 30 days 45 days could be as high as 60 days depending on the type of loan uh, generally jumbo loans those that have higher balances take longer to underwrite um, but i would just say if i were to give you a general answer 30 days is reasonable mm -hmm. and uh, i hear the term uh, a lock on the rate um, can you talk a little bit about what that is and, and how, that, uh, how that works? Yeah, a lock is a commitment or a, the block of money that we reserve for a client. So if we're refinancing a million dollar loan, we can lock it at let's say 3% for a certain period of time, 30 days or 45 days or 60 days generally. In this environment, we lock for 60 days just to make sure we have enough cushion if the process starts to move very slowly beyond our control. That's what a lock is. So if we say your loan is locked at 3%, that means we guarantee that price throughout the process, and that's where, that's what, where you'll sign your promissory note at 3%. It's a guarantee that the price won't change. Um, when do we lock? Uh, we lock when we feel the market is going in the wrong direction and rates may be increasing. We will advise the client to lock. There are periods where we think the, the uh, rate should be floating. That means we just let the market do whatever it does. We watch it closely. When it's time to lock, we we'll lock it. Generally, um, will float if we think the market is going to improve. We can keep our eyes on that market every day throughout the day, um, and we, we, we communicate that to, to our client. If it's time to lock, we'll lock it. And what about um, the, the term points? Uh, can you explain to the viewers what, what that means and, and uh, what that, uh, how that affects what they pay? Yes. Um, a point is a cost, generally it's 1%. One point is 1% of the amount that, that someone is borrowing. Um, an we're gonna call it an orig origination point. You can pay, a borrower pays an origination point generally to lower their rate. So if we offer the client 3%, he or she may say, what does it take to push that rate down to 2.875 or two and three quarters? And then we can offer half a point of cost in order to push that rate lower. So um, we we always give the clients several choices in, and we you know we're, we'll do the math for them. We'll put the numbers on the table and they'll look at it. It's very clear to choose what makes more sense. Now, sometimes you pay a point and it makes sense to go in that direction where you get a lower rate. Um, most of the time people don't pay points and they get a rate that makes sense. In some cases, bringing people from a high rate environment into a lower rate, we may even be able to do a no cost loan where um, not only the client doesn't pay a point, but we have enough, um, uh, and this may be too, too much detail, but the way we get paid from, from the, the lender is through, um, if I put it simply, let's call it commission. So there's a certain amount of commission coming to us and we can take part of that money and give it to the borrower to pay for all the closing costs. 
That's what a no-cost loan is. Does that make sense? Well, in some cases it does. It's really no cost because no cost means a higher rate, right? Um, so um, it really depends. We'll look at a, a, a certain scenario and see what makes sense. We'll provide it to the client. We'll, we'll talk about it. We'll discuss it. And then once we all come to an agreement, whether someone wants to pay a point or not, that's the direction we'll take. And it, it's the client's choice, right? You, you're going to say, we could do it this way, uh, and you'll pay a little bit more, get a little more rate, or you could pay a little bit less up here and pay a little bit higher rate, and then the client makes the decision as far as which ones of those they, they would like to go with. Is that right? Absolutely. Definitely, it's the client's choice. And, and I, I, I said this before, we'll, we'll do the math. It's very simple to see which direction, direction makes more sense to the client. And they'll look at it, they'll decide which, which way they wanna to go. To, to us, it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. But we'd, we'd like to see them go in a direction where they save money, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, uh, I, I really appreciate all of this info, Sam. Uh, the, uh, the, the current rates are um, historically so low. I think the current rates are even lower than what my dad got a loan for back, you know, way back when, when he was building his first house. So, and those were considered low rates. So um, uh, this, this seems like something that uh, people ought to at least investigate, especially if they have a current mortgage, they ought to take a look at what, what might be offered here and what it might cost and what it might save them and do some calculation. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I agree. I mean, I've, I, we, I started in this business in 1998 and we had high rate environments and very low rate environments. We've never had it this low, right? Since then, we've, we've had, yeah. I believe, 2005, four, five, six, I can't recall exactly which year we, we had an environment where rates were quite low, but really not this low. And they didn't really last the duration wasn't there. I mean, we've been in this environment for a long period of time, and we're expecting this to continue for, for quite a while, for at least most of 2021. Um, so yeah, it's definitely important just to look at what someone has. Maybe it doesn't make sense to touch it, but that just doesn't mean we shouldn't look at it, right? Um, so it's important just to analyze it and see if a client is good, where they are, or there is, an improvement we can talk about. Don't forget, there are people who have second mortgages, equity lines. Those are adjustable rate mortgages. They're typically um, interest only for the first 10 years, and then they turn into principal interest payment for the remainder of the life of that loan. When that kicks in, the payment is high, higher than what an individual has been paying interest only the first 10 years at a higher interest rate, right? High interest rate, short time frame to pay off that loan. So it gets ugly very fast. So if someone has an equity line and they can, they can combine, it, combine it with a new first, take a, take a low rate, this is a good time to do it, right? Um, and then we talked about debt consolidation, unsecured debt. This is a good time to do it if they're interested in blending that into a, a low rate first mortgage. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a good time to look at it. This is a, a very, very low rate environment across the board, conforming loans, even jumbo loans. Yeah, I'm, I'm viewing this as, a, as a, you know, a time of opportunity for most people. I mean, especially if, if you're talking about, you know, refinancing something into a, you know, a, a 30 year fixed loan, you're talking about saving money over the course of the next 30 years. Um, that adds up to a significant amount of money if, if you're reducing the rate by some significant percentage. Uh, when you do the calculation, it's, you know, it, it's a lot of money that it saves you. It's, and it's, this a, is it's, a, it's a lot of money. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned interest over a certain period of time. Very simply, we can plug in numbers in our software and show what an individual is paying now in interest with what they have 
and we'll say, um, look, Mr. Barrow, over the next 60 months, this is how much interest you'll be paying if you keep your three and three quarter interest rate or 4% interest rate. And if we take it and convert it into a two and a half interest rate, and I'm throwing these rates out, so don't pay too much attention to, to, to these rates, but, um, but we'll take a lower, a scenario with a lower interest rate and show them how much interest they'll be saving over the next 60 months and compare them side by side or over the life of the loan, we can compare these. So those numbers are very easy to see and understand. And I really don't have to push a certain product or a certain um, step that a borrower has to take. He or she can look at it and understand, should I keep it or redo it? Very easy. Yeah. Well, this is all very enlightening, Sam. Uh, is, there, is there anything I haven't covered here that you think uh, uh, listeners uh, might like? I mean, I know there's a lot of arcane terminology and, and the structure of, of how these things work that may be beyond the scope of what we ought to cover today. But uh, is there anything else you'd, you'd like to add before we sign off here? No, I, look, I, I think we covered everything. The most important piece here is that I understand a lot of clients get intimidated by this. They step into their intimidated or um, reserved about um, picking up the phone and asking questions because they think they'll be locked into a never ending call uh, scenario where they'll get pushed into uh, uh, refinancing or buying. We don't do that. We we're very low key. We look at facts and see if something can be improved. We offer our advice. If it can't be, we offer our advice and do it at a later time. So there's no, at least as far as we're concerned, we, you know, we're not, we're not salespeople that pressure people to do things that they shouldn't be doing. So, so if there's that um, reservation, I want people to know that's not the case here. We're, we're looking at this uh, from the standpoint of um, logic and does it make sense to take certain steps? If it does, we offer advice. If it doesn't, then it doesn't, we stop. So, um, but the rest of it, the mechanics of it, um, it's complicated. You client don't need to be um, involved with the complication. We take care of it. We keep it simple, nice and clean. Um, so the, so life will be easier for the client. So as far as that's concerned, it's nice and clean, but in terms of feeling like a certain, if you're going to be pushed into a situation where you're being um, pushed by a salesperson, please don't feel that way, at least with us. We don't do that. That's great, Sam. Well, Sam, th thanks so much for um, helping to shed some light on this topic that I think is, is relevant for just about everybody today. And it's also um, intimidating and challenging for people to wrap their heads around. So hopefully this information will uh, help people move a little bit uh, further in their thinking about how this can benefit them. And I just wanna thank you again for helping us to understand this uh, complicated process. And um, we look forward to our next conversation. Uh, I, I guess I should also add here that uh, Sam is uh, also uh, can handle uh, real estate purchases and sales. So he's kind of unique in that way in that uh, he brokers the loans and he is also has a real estate license. So. Um, uh, this it, it turns into a benefit for uh, the uh, purchaser, the seller, uh, in that uh, there are fewer hands uh, to be able to hand off and potentially drop the ball or misunderstand things when you have different people doing these jobs. And um, so that might be uh, something that uh, clients uh, might also want to consider is that it's a little bit more of a streamlined uh, process with Sam here. Uh, okay. Well, thank, thanks everybody for tuning in to this uh, episode of uh, Let's Talk. Uh, as always, I learn things from these things. I learn things from you, Sam, and I, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, explain how this all works. 
And until next time, uh, my name's Tom Rizzo, and we look forward to seeing everybody on the next episode of Let's Talk. Until then, uh, take good care. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sam. Well, that's it for today's broadcast. Thanks so much for joining us today. I hope you'll come back for more. We've got some really great guests lined up, and we'll be sure to let you know when the episodes are available. Thanks again for watching.